Welcome to the show, Podcast World. It's time for episode 372 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at www.dankseed.store. I like to start the podcast off by letting you know what I'm smoking on. Today, I've been taking dabs of banana OG ambrosia from Apothecary Farms. On the label, it says, it is 83.2% THC and a total of 97% total cannabinoids. I really enjoyed the banana OG. It is kind of a change from what I usually buy. I usually like a concentrate that makes my head spin, makes my eyes vibrate, makes it hard to think. Uh, the banana OG is kind of more of a mellow thing. It's got me kind of chilled out. It's kind of slow motion. It's got my eyes nice and heavy. It's got my shoulders nice and chilled out. And I really dig the flavor of the banana OG. So that's what I'm dabbing on today. I hope you guys are taking dabs of something delicious. I'm not sure if you can tell, but I still have a little bit of that head cold hanging around. I'm trying to get rid of that. I'm not going to let it slow me down. I am going to deliver a quality podcast. In this episode, I plan to bring you another grow lesson. Before we get to the grow lesson, I've got a couple of quick things to cover. I am working on the website. Of course, I am Irie Genetics Colorado. My website is irigeneticscolorado.com. We are currently doing some updates. During the process of updating the website, something went completely freaking wrong, and the podcast does not work from the website anymore. All of the episodes that were up before the update are still accessible. None of the new things I add to the website are posting to the RSS feed. My web guy is working on it. It is the holiday weekend, so he has taken a few days off, but I'm sure he will get back on it as soon as the weekend is over. My point is, I know the website is messed up, and I apologize for not having the episodes out on iTunes and Stitcher as regularly scheduled. I was just recently bragging about not missing a Monday in five years, and now here I am. I've missed at least one Monday. It looks like I may potentially miss two Mondays in a row. I do apologize. However, the episodes are recorded and the shows are posted on YouTube, so I have not stopped recording. I haven't stopped doing the shows. I'm just unable to post them to iTunes and Stitcher because of a glitch with my website. So please be patient with me and please keep listening to the show and please find the show on YouTube if that is your only option of listening for the next couple of weeks. And also real quick, I want to give a shout out to the guy who works on the website for me. I don't know if he listens to the show uh, regularly or at all, but hey, if you're listening, man, uh, big thanks for keeping the website updated. Big thanks for all the updates lately. And also big thanks for getting it fixed when you do get the RSS feed back in action. All right, since I'm giving shout outs, let's give some shout outs to a few of our Patreon supporters. I owe a big shout out to Jade. How about a big Patreon shout out to Grimble the Druid and also a Patreon shout out to Tanner Martinwick. And of course, another shout out to my friend Mel. Thank you for all of the Patreon support. I truly do appreciate it. And if you want to learn how to become a patron, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com. It's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash grow from your heart. All of the information you need will be right there on the screen. And again, thank you for all of the Patreon support. All right, podcast world. I said earlier, this was going to be another grow lesson. So far in my series of grow lessons, we should have plants that are probably 12 to 14, maybe 16 or 18 inches tall. They are probably in three or five or maybe seven gallon pots. Hopefully they are nice and healthy. They have got a fat root system. Hopefully they're pest free at this time. Hopefully you haven't over or under fertilized them. We've talked a lot about the proper environment and conditions and feeding for these plants. So I think we know how to take care of them by now. Let's talk about a few ways to improve our productivity and the vigor of our large veg plants. Now, none of this stuff is required. None of this stuff is mandatory. These are the little tips and tricks and bonus things that I do to boost productivity and boost vigor to kind of turbocharge the overall performance of my garden. One really easy thing I like to do to all of my plants to increase performance is just clean off the crap on the bottoms of the plants. You've got a stalk coming out of the dirt, and then you've got a few crappy branches coming off the bottom, and then the next couple of branches will be more substantial, and then you'll have some solid branches. If those very bottom branches are crappy, don't be afraid to remove them. If you feel like they are a waste of growth on the plant, feel free to take them off. We are going to lollipop heavily once we go into flower, so don't be afraid to move some of the crappy bottom branches. If it's a long, healthy branch that has the potential to reach the canopy level, you can leave it. But if it's ugly, if it's droopy, if it's sucking up energy and not going to produce anything 
it would be worthwhile, feel free to take it off. Then that plant can focus its energy moving up toward the top of the plant where we want to build that lush canopy. So feel free to take crap off of the bottom. So now we've removed the crappy bottom branches that are kind of a waste of energy. Here is another thing we can do to the bottom section of our plant to improve the performance and move the energy up toward the top. We've still got bottom branches because we left some of those bottom branches on the plant. The inside bottom branching is not going to receive much light. So what I like to do is find that branch and just follow it up and remove any shoots that I feel like are a waste of space. So you'll have an, a thick arm coming off and then off of that, you'll have like a little tiny sub arm coming off. Those are the shoots. Those are on the bottom of the plant. Those are a waste of space. Those are going to turn into buds we do not want to trim. That is going to be fluffy, larfy, useless, little crap. It is a trimmer's nightmare. By removing that crap from the bottom, we direct the energy up toward the top. We can make bigger top chunky buds. Those are better for trimmers. Those are better for the market. Those are better for the consumer. Everybody wants those big fat buds. So let's clean off that crap off the bottom. So you've got the main stock coming out. Then you've got your bottom two, your bottom four branches. Follow those branches up, and where you don't see any light touching those little shoots, feel free to just pinch them or cut them right off. While you're cutting or pinching or cleaning stuff off of plants, always keep this in mind. You can go back later and take more off, but you cannot glue the leaves and the shoots back onto the plant. So pay attention to what you're doing, but on that bottom section, just pull that crap in the inside right off of there. I go fairly hard on the bottom parts of the plants. I plan on lollipopping heavily early in flower anyway, so why not pull off a lot of that crap now and send the energy up toward the top of the plant? Now, while you're cleaning the bottoms of the plants, keep in mind that it may be wise to take some clones before we put these plants into flower. What are you going to grow next? Are you growing from seed that you spent a lot of money on? If you paid a lot of money for those seeds, I definitely recommend you take a clone off of each seedling and mark it. We're going to talk about this in depth in a future episode, but if you've got a plant from seed, I recommend you take a clone from it. Mark that plant, plant A. Mark your clone, clone A. Go on down the line with every seedling plant that you've got. Then grow them out. Either grow out the clone or grow out the original plant. And if you've got something amazing, now you have got a keeper clone of that to keep around. We're going to talk about pheno hunting. We'll talk about mother plants. We're going to talk about that sort of stuff in a future episode. But this is something to think about while we are cleaning the bottoms of our plants. Do you want to use those two bottom branches may make excellent clones. Some of those shoots may have grown big enough to turn into a clone. Keep that in mind while you're cleaning up the bottoms of your plants. Now let's talk about another way to improve the productivity of our plant and also a great way to score a great clone from a healthy plant. And of course, I'm talking about topping. Topping our plant can greatly improve the performance of our plant if it is done at the appropriate time and at the appropriate place in the plant. Now, when I say appropriate time, we can do this at just about any point in veg once the plant is large enough. The plants we are talking about are certainly large enough if we are in large veg. This is prime time for topping. We have to top approximately 10 to 14 days before we enter the flowering phase. When we top a cannabis plant, our mission is to remove that top node out of the plant, that giant one that's sticking out of the top, making it look like a Christmas tree. We want to remove that. And our goal is to make the next set of branches become two tops. And that will create competition within the branches of the plant that will make all of the branches try to reach up and become the next top. Basically, somebody killed the king, and now all of those next soldiers are trying to be the next king. The hormones in the plant will indicate we're missing a top. Somebody needs to take over. Cannabis has a trait that is called apical dominance. It really wants one dominant top. When you remove that dominant top, the rest of the tops know there's an opportunity for them to become that main top. So you can top the plants at various ages and at various stages. Let's talk about the process of doing it. Let me back up and talk about doing it. Find that top branch where it's too tall. Trace it down. The way I like to do it, I kind of find a spot where I'm thinking about cutting it and I bend it over and I look at the plant and I say, what would the plant look like without that section? Is that too much to cut off? Is that going to be beneficial? What is my goal in topping right now? Mainly my goal, instead of having one giant top, I want to create sort of a bush so that I can grow space and not have one giant bud hitting the light. 
but instead I can have a four by four section of a bunch of buds growing into the light instead of just one. By taking out that main top, you create that whole section into a bush. So see which one is going to cut out and make the others look like a nice even canopy. You will see it. You'll get good at it. It'll take a little bit of trial and error. It'll take some confidence. It is also very strain specific. Topping an OG Kush or something like that can be a real bitch because the nodes are so far apart that you just make it look like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. But once it grows out of that, it is going to be amazing. The more sativa dominant stuff, if you top Scarlet Begonias, if you top Storm Shadow, it makes a beautiful bush and they go crazy. So kind of grab the top and follow, work your way down with your hand and just kind of look and see what it would it look like if I took this off. And you'll come to a point, you'll take off one and you'll see two branches that stick up evenly toward the top and the two branches underneath that almost come right up to that top section as well. You'll have four nice new tops and you'll say, that's what Rasta Jeff is talking about. I want to make these four tops the tops. And then just cut that one out and you'll see exactly what I've got. You're probably going to screw up a couple of plants. That's how you learn stuff. Musicians have to fuck up songs to learn. BMX racers have to fall on their face to learn. Skateboarders get stitches and break bones to learn. Luckily, we mess up plants. We can grow more plants. It doesn't hurt us that bad when we cut up a plant the wrong way. Hopefully, you've got a couple more and you're going to learn. The cost of cutting that one plant from what you learn from it is invaluable. So get in there and just play around with the scissors. Top some of them. Bottom some of them up. See what they do. Finish them. That way you have some data. Now keep in mind that data is very strain specific. Like I said earlier, if you're topping an OG Kush plant, you're going to have totally different results than if you're topping something like a haze or a more sativa dominant, like a golden goat kind of a thing. The growth structure is just naturally different in those plants. Now, when you're topping your plant, do it at the intersection where it's going to encourage that plant the most expansive growth. So if you've got two branches, you've got the main stalk coming up, you've got a branch coming out, and then maybe an inch up, you've got a branch coming out, cut right above that top branch. You don't need to leave anything hanging off or anything extra. Cut it right at the intersection where you want to encourage the spread. You basically want to take an upside down peace sign and you want to turn it into a Y and those new tops of the Y are going to be the new two tops of the plant. And then the next two branches, hopefully they'll catch up. Now that puts me back to why I said we want to do this at least 10 to 14 days before we go into flower. Uh, or much sooner than that, if it's an opportunity. Uh, when we make that cut, we've just cut out the king. Like I said earlier, we need time for those hormones to move around into the plant. And that helps us when we go into flower. We get much larger bud sets. If you, if you flower too soon after topping, your plants just create little popcorn buds. The hormones haven't moved around. They're not exactly sure what to do. They're not sure where the top should go. So you just get a bunch of little popcorns. So give the plant plenty of time to recover plenty of time to move the hormones, and plenty of time for it to decide where the tops are going to be after topping and before moving your plants into flower. Earlier, I mentioned that this would be a good opportunity for a clone. That top you just cut off should be the most robust, hardiest part of your plant. That will make a great candidate for a clone. So why not snag that up? Now you've got a big, fat, healthy clone for the next crop while you're increasing the productivity of the current crop. All right, so we've covered two great ways to increase the vigor and productivity of our plants. We figured out how to properly move the energy to the part of the plant we want to grow. You can move it up to the top by taking stuff off the bottom. You can spread it out by completely eliminating the top. In that process, we have also created the opportunity to create clones. Now, let's talk about another great technique that I use in a personal garden. I use this in a breeding program. I use this in a large commercial grow. This is something I implement in almost any grow I get to play in. I call it the pop and twist technique. You may also know it as super cropping. It has got a lot of names. It is the same thing no matter what we call it. I like to pop the stems of the plant. I like to kind of pop their knuckles. I don't know if you could hear that on the microphone. I tried to get it in there. That's basically the sound I'm looking for. Once the plants are a little bit thicker than a pen or a pencil, maybe a Sharpie, I like to grab them right where they come out of the dirt. I grab the stalk kind of firmly with one hand, then I grab it with another hand right above it, and I twist my top hand. I don't twist that hand that's coming out of the dirt. I don't want to twist that dirt. I twist the top hand to where I break the cellulose of the plant, break that outer structure to where you hear it pop a little bit. It'll go crunch just like my knuckle did, and it'll make a little pop sound, and you'll feel it. 
and you'll be freaked out the first time. It's okay. Don't freak out. You're doing exactly what I recommend. This will increase vigor and productivity in a couple of ways. This will be beneficial in a couple of ways. Let's talk about that real quick, and we'll talk more about how to do this throughout the entire plant. The first thing you'll notice when you're popping the knuckles on these plants is they will start to make little knuckles on the branches. I feel like these make the plants more stout, more robust, so that when they start to grow buds, those branches can hold up bigger buds. Bigger branches, bigger buds, right? That makes sense. You want more support. Bigger legs, you can lift more, right? You're stronger. I, I don't know if that maths out. I'm not kind of a weightlifter guy, but if you got more, you can lift more, right? So you want something able to support bigger buds. Also, those bigger stems can probably feed those bigger flowers better. So you've got more movement. Another way this is beneficial is it will slow down the vertical growth of the plants. They won't get so tall so quickly because they will be spending a little bit of their energy on getting fatter and more robust. They'll be short and stocky, which is way beneficial to almost any grower. We are, most of us are limited by height. In a home grow, in a commercial grow, in a giant warehouse grow, most of us are still limited by height. So having this one tip to control the height of our plants just a little bit can be very advantageous. Later on, we're going to talk about trellising. If you can use cracking and trellising together, you can really control the height of your plants and you can really maximize productivity. So those are a few reasons why I like to crack the stems. Now let's talk a little bit more about actually doing it now that I've given you a good reason why to do this. Like I said, I grab the stick with one hand, I grab the stick with another, and I just twist opposite directions. And you'll hear it. It will go pop and crunch, then just move up. I start with the main stalk of the plant and I work my way almost almost 90% up the way of the plant. As long as I can feel it still crunching, as long as I'm not feeling like I'm about to rip the top off the plant when I give it a twist, I'll work my way right up. Then I go to the bottom branch and work my way right up the bottom branch. Then the next branch and give it a crack. I'll give it a crack. I'm looking at the microphone stand here trying to think about the distance of cracks. I go one and then it's only four to six inches apart, depending on the size of the plant. I will crack it. Maybe if it's a tiny plant, if they're short and squat, I would go every three inches if I feel like that plant could take it. Most of them will take it about every four to six inches without any problems. Give it a little crack, move up, give it a little crack, move up, give it a little crack. Just do that to every plant in the garden. It will slow down their growth. It'll make them more robust. They'll be more vigorous. And you can continue to do this all the way into about week three of flower. So if you start it early in veg, you can get a good cracking in there. Give them about seven, maybe 10 days to heal up. Go back, give them another good crack, throw them into flower. As they get bigger, they will recover more quickly from being busted on. So go in there, give them a good crack on day one of flower, right at the start of the flowering cycle, slow down that stretch a little bit. And then think about it this way. If you crack spot one and then spot two, there's a spot in the middle of that that you can crack next time. So you can go back in a week, and even if they haven't healed up from all of their cracking, you can crack those middle spots and make even another little knuckle, another little knurled spot on your plants. Don't be afraid to get in there and do some work on them and bust them up a little bit. They will recover, and they will really show progress from this. I know I probably sound like I'm crazy because for the past 10 minutes, I've been telling you to cut stuff off of your plants and break them and bend them, and that's going to increase productivity. But how do you get stronger? Through stress, through proper training. And that's what we're going to do to these plants. We're going to tell them what we want from them, and we're going to show them what we expect, and they're going to give it to us with the proper guidance. Speaking of guidance, let's work our way into talking about canopy control. Earlier, I mentioned that our plants are apical dominant, meaning they want to grow straight up. Unfortunately for us as growers, it does not benefit us for the plants to grow straight up. We need to fill horizontal space. We need to spread them out a little bit. We have several options for encouraging our plants to spread out. Our earlier work of topping them was a great start, but we can go much further than that. A very easy, affordable, and effective way to spread out our plants a little bit is by using sticks. You can get bamboo sticks at the local grow store for very cheap. I like to put about four sticks per pot, and I like to put them toward the outer edge of the pot. Don't go too far in because you've got a lot of root development there. You don't want to go shoving a bamboo stick right through a bunch of roots. So go out toward the edge of the pot, put the stick in there. If your plants are going to grow six feet tall, get a six foot stick. If your plants are only going to grow three feet tall, get a three foot stick. You don't want a stick too big to where you can't lower the light close enough to the canopy. 
So get the appropriate size stick. Put three or four, five or six of them in the pot, depending on how many giant floppy branches branches you've got. Then you can just pull those big branches down just a little bit and attach them to the sticks. Now, instead of just having them going straight up, you've kind of pulled them down a little bit. Now, they're probably one or two, maybe three inches shorter, depending on how far you pull them down. Pull them down and affix them to those sticks. Now, you're doing a couple of things. You're making the plant overall shorter, and you're also widening the plant up to let some light get into that inner part of the plant, where you don't have to clean off as much of that crap in the inside. More of the light can penetrate in there, and you will get more production from the inside part of the plant. Now, these sticks will also work for another purpose. When those buds start to develop and get fat and big, those sticks will support your buds. You're going to need something to hold up the big buds. So now is the time to think about it. Let's work that into our canopy control and also our plan for supporting our buds. So sticks is the easiest, most affordable option. If you've got a small grow, if you've got a home grow, sticks are probably the most economical. If you've got several plants, a bunch of sticks can become a pain in the ass. In a commercial environment, I wouldn't even mess with sticks. In a commercial environment, you may want to start working with tomato cages. You need to get the tomato cages on the plants before they get too big. I usually like a tomato cage with about a 16 inch top. Sometimes I will cut the very bottom ring off of the tomato cage, right? Flip it upside down, right where that bottom ring is, cut it off. You've just made it a little bit shorter, but it's also a little bit wider. You can customize them for your situation. So slide the tomato cage over the plant. Spread the plant out nice and wide. Let it spread as wide as it will go. Encourage it to spread out. If you need to pull some of the branches out of the cage, pull it out of the cage, and as it grows, it'll work itself up, and when it gets real tall, put the branch back into the cage. Or use those runners up the side, the side supports, and you can always affix the branches to those side supports by using a bread tie or a twisty tie or some sort of garden supply twist tie. There are thousands of options for that. Get creative. I've used a bunch of different things. We don't need to be too specific. I use zip ties in most cases, but don't go too tight. So if you've got your tomato cage on your plant, the branches are falling out and gaining support from the outer perimeter of the tomato cage. Maybe you've worked some of the branches up the side of that tomato cage. Maybe you pulled some of the branches down and spread them out by using those outer rings of the tomato cage. The tomato cage gives us a lot of creative options for controlling the canopy of our plant while at the same time providing support for our tall, heavy buds. Now, if you're using a tomato cage and you did not top your plant, which is just fine, that is always an option. You do not have to top the plants. A lot of people like that one big glory bud at the top. If you're going for that glory bud and you are using a tomato cage, you still may need a stick to support that giant bud if you grow a big fat top. So don't be afraid to make them work together. You can have a tomato cage with a stick holding up that giant bud in the middle. Again, if you're going to put a stick in a giant pot, I would kind of recommend putting it toward the outer edge and then angling it toward the center if you need support in the center. I don't like to ram a bamboo stake right into the root zone. That just feels rude to me. If you want it to be right in the middle because you've got some kind of OCD or that's where you need to do it, you can do it, but just you'll feel it when you go through those roots and it won't feel right. So those are two very effective methods of controlling your canopy and also supporting the large branches and being prepared for having large buds. I know I kind of glazed over those two methods. Those are things you're going to have to perfect and work on. It's going to be things you have to put your hands on to learn how to do it. It's kind of an art. There'll be things that you learn when you're doing it that will work perfectly for your situation that would not work for the next guy. The sticks are really easy because you can just stick as many sticks into a pot as you need. I mean, I've seen people go completely excessive. Try not to be too crazy, but you can stick as many sticks into a pot of soil as you need to support as many branches as you need. And you can use fuzzy sticks or bread ties or zip ties, whatever you need to affix those branches to those sticks, however you need. It's a little harder to lower the canopy that way, but you can get big branch support that way really easily. The tomato cages, you can use the zip ties or the twisty ties, and you have got round circles to work with. You can use those to keep the plants down. You can bend the branches underneath the rings of the tomato cage, or you can use those to support the big buds. You've got a lot of options there to work with, but you're going to have to play with it to figure it out. I can walk you so far through it, but it's going to be strain dependent, situational dependent, but those are very versatile tools to work with, and I'm sure you'll find some use. Now, let me quit rambling and talk about one of my favorite methods of canopy control, which is using trellis netting, also known as scrog netting. 
And of course, scrog, S-C-R-O-G, just means screen of green. We're using a screen to create a nice green canopy. Let's talk about creating a screen of green. The number one most common mistake I see people make when they are setting up their screen or their trellis netting for their screen of green or for their canopy control is they put the netting way too loose. It needs to be tighter. You want that stuff really tight. You want it almost scary tight. You want a lot of tension on there. You don't want those squares. You don't want the net to move at all. You want those squares to stay right in place because that is what is going to control the shape of your plant. If those things move, the plant moves. I like them tight, nice and firm like a guitar string. So let's talk more about the netting now that I've already pointed out the number one mistake. Let's say we're setting up a net in a five by five tent. It's really easy to set them up in a tent. They've already got the poles. If you don't have poles or something to affix it to, you're going to need to design some sort of system. You can attach it to the wall. A lot of people will get a five gallon bucket from Lowe's or Home Depot. They will fill it up with quickcrete and then they will stick a six foot tall PVC pole into there sticking straight up. Now you've got a nice vertical pole that you can work with to attach your net to and that will hold a lot of weight. You can probably get it tight enough with that five gallon bucket filled with cement. That'll be enough weight to be able to pull those screens super tight. So get yourself four buckets, fill them up with the quickcrete, put a six foot pole in each one. Now you make a little square. Now you can make just about any type of length or width of shape you need to put your trellis netting. I think they sell it in five by five squares, five by 10 squares. If you want to go commercial grade, you can get it in much larger uh, segments, sections, whatever the word you want to use right there, you can get it. Uh, in a commercial environment, I recommend the six foot wide commercial greenhouse tables. I have found a six foot wide roll of plastic trellis netting that works beautifully for that application. It is six feet wide and it is, I think, 75 or 120 feet long and it is one roll. So you just put it up on top of the trellis. You got one guy on one side, one guy on the other, and it's on a roll. So you just walk and it, you zip tie one end of it down, one end of it down, and you walk the length you need to be. And you zip tie the other end, zip tie the other end, and you cut it off. And now the trellis net is up. You, of course, you got to go back through and tighten it by using more zip ties, but that's almost kind of fun once you've got it put up that easily. So the long rolls are amazing. They get a little bit heavy, but if you've got two big dudes, I'm 6'5". My buddy Brian, he was six foot something. We just grab it, lift it just above plant height, walk right down the rows, stretch out a long enough piece to cover that whole row, zip tie it at the end and cut our section off. We'd have another guy following behind us and he would put zip ties in place to keep it real tight. And it would take us just a few minutes to get each row done. So you've got to start by spreading out your trellis netting. That's always fun. If it comes folded up in that little baggie, it is such a bitch to get that undone. Good luck. You look like Spider-Man attacked you and fucking won. You're going to be there for a few minutes getting that unfolded. The bigger the net, the longer it takes. Don't get frustrated. Go smoke a dab. And then, no, you know what? Don't smoke a dab because when you get all stoned and you're trying to look at that netting, that shit doesn't work for your face. So just unfold that. And then once we get it put up, we'll go take some dabs. So unfold the trellis netting the best you can. It's going to take you a few minutes. Get it put up on whatever poles you've got available. I said we're going to work in a five by five tent. Hopefully you bought a five by five section of netting. It may be too big. You may need to go in a square. You may not need to use that outer square. You may need to go one or two squares into that grid to make it fit tight enough. You don't have to necessarily use every square of that netting. We want it tight more than we want the amount of squares. So get that net up there tight. Use a bunch of zip ties. Go excessive if you need it to. We want that thing fairly tight. Then lower it down onto the plant canopy. You'll watch the plants kind of bend. You want to just keep going. Just kind of bend them down just a little bit. Not too far, maybe like three or four inches. They'll bend. They'll be okay. If you see something that's about to crack, of course, grab it and give it a hand. The idea here is to actually lower the height of all of the plants, and we are going to use that net to control the height of the plants. Don't worry, because we're going to go back and manually adjust each branch by hand and work it into this net correctly. But right now, we just kind of want to lower it down and watch that canopy just become even. Now, you can see how this works. We have, instead of one giant bud here, one long branch here, one giant bud on a long branch over here, now we've got a nice even space to work with. We want to fill all that five by five net with a bunch of small bud sites that will actually turn into more productivity than one giant bud here, one giant bud here that are trying to touch the light. We're fighting those from getting too hot, getting burnt, getting crispy. And then we've got a bunch of buds down here that aren't getting enough light. Instead, we've got a nice five by five screen of green of just beautiful, even buds. So let's talk about how to work these branches 
into this net to create this desired canopy. Working a section of plants into a trellis net is a bit of an art, and it will take some experience to perfect it. Think of it sort of like weaving. We want to weave these plants that want to go vertical. We want to weave them into the net to encourage them to go horizontally. Now, almost no matter what we do to these plants other than kill them, they're going to try to grow up because earlier we spoke of that hormone that gives them apical dominance. So we are going to need to stay on top of canopy control in this trellis system. The idea is to fill each square of that trellis net with a branch that will develop into a substantial bud site. The way to start that process is to train these plants to spread wide instead of tall. So we use this first layer of netting to actually spread the plants out. Now what we have to do as the plants grow is they will try to pop up out of the net. We need to go in there every day and grab those branches that tried to get away and just push them back under that next piece of net. So as soon as they're long enough to go under net, underneath the next section, just weave them right underneath there. And what will happen is you will develop long arms that fill up the entire space. And when we flip it to flower, all of those branches will develop bud sites that will fill up each square of that trellis netting. Now, instead of having plants that just grow big giant buds and grow up into the light and are really good for pictures, we are actually producing a large crop by utilizing the entire 5x5 five five canopy space. Now, this will take some practice to figure out exactly what I'm saying. Some of you are going to try to force those plants down too much. Somebody that taught me a lot of tips on trellis work will tell you, give it a fucking chance. You've got to give it somewhere to grow up and win. The tips of the branches like to go up. Give them a chance to win. But don't be scared to get in there and bend them down. Now, something that is hard to convey through uh, just audio without any sort of visual is you may think that to get this branch, the tip of this branch under this net, that you may need to bend it at wrist height. I'm showing myself, I'm comparing the microphone stand to my wrist. The microphone stand is horizontal. My wrist is growing up like a plant. I want to tuck this, my wrist underneath this uh, piece of trellising. Instead of grabbing at my wrist and bending there and tucking that part under, I would actually go down to elbow height, to my elbow joint, and pop it down there and bend it underneath the trellis at that height. That gives me a lot more room for when that plant starts growing vertically. It's going to grow out horizontally because of gravity for a little while. The tip will start growing up, and it's going to take it a little bit longer to grow up out of that net again. Don't be afraid to crack it lower than you think you need to, is what I'm trying to say. Hopefully that gave you enough different explanations to try to catch on to what I'm saying. But if you think you need to crack it here to get it underneath the net that's right here, go a little lower so you've got more bending room to work with and you've also got more room for future growth. You guys, trellising and canopy work is an art, but when you get good at it, it will drastically improve productivity and it will also make the garden much easier to work in because it's much more organized and you don't have that one giant bud that's trying to grow into the light, which is so photogenic and it's so beautiful to have, but it's also such a pain in the ass because that's the one bud you are working your whole garden setup around. So you will learn how to weave your plants into this net perfectly. You will adapt your own style. You'll, I'm sure you're going to the internet to look at pictures of how to do it already. You'll see a lot of great stuff on there. You will also see a lot of trellis nets that were not filled sufficiently before the plants were flipped into flower. Fill that shit out. It takes a little bit of time. It takes more work, but it is much more rewarding than just growing that one glory bud. So if you're going to use the screen to spread them out, make sure you fill up that canopy before you flip. Now, I also recommend a second layer of trellis netting. I probably would put that one, depending on the power of your light, depending on your genetics, I would probably put my second net somewhere between 6 and 12 inches above that first net. Now, the bottom net will fill up. You'll weave it all in and it will get full. Now you want to let those branches start growing up into that second net. You want to fill it up to where you've got one branch coming out of each of those bottom squares. And those will grow up into the top squares. As soon as they hit the top squares, you want to flower. Now you've got a nice 6 to 12 inch section of just rows of buds, just rows of branches sticking straight up. I would almost lollipop and bottom and defoliate almost everything underneath that first net. That all gets cleaned off. All that larfy stuff, the canopy isn't, the light's not going to penetrate the canopy far enough to make that worth anything. I generally clean all that off. So that bottom net is there to spread them out and give them control. You want to spread the plant that would be growing five feet tall straight up. 
We've got it three feet tall, but it's also spread five by five feet wide. So we're trying to fill in all that net space. Then we're going to let it grow a little bit vertically out of that until it kind of gets close to that next net. Then we're going to flower. All those branches that are sticking straight up are going to turn into big fat buds that will grow into that second net. That second net at that point is going to work as a support. It's only going to be there to hold up all of your giant buds. Quite often in a commercial environment, I've had to use a triple trellis and sometimes we have considered a fourth. That's all going to depend on your genetics and what kind of lights you're using. Of course, we're using things like a rise underneath Gavita lighting in a commercial environment. We were getting serious growth. If you're in a tent, you're only going to need the spread net and then the one net up top for support. Now, if you want to use the trellis netting and you don't want to work it into the net as far, if you just want to use it more for a spread and not kind of create the scrog, you can do that. You don't have to work them as far. You can just put the net on and spread them out. Try to get one stick per branch if you can. Try not to overcrowd anything. The idea is just to spread it out. You kind of want to spread them, make them shorter than they were tall. You want to use more of that vertical space. Somebody taught us a long time ago, if you've got a cooler, do you just want to put one layer of beer in that cooler or do you want to fill that whole cooler up with beer? That's kind of what we're trying to do with our canopy. We don't just want a couple of beers touching the light. We don't want to make a beer tower. We want to knock all those beers down and put them in one nice a case just like they were sold in because that's how they stack the best. That's how you can fill it the best. I'm not even a beer drinker and I still want to fit as many beers as we can in a cooler. Also, I should recommend an article I read a long time ago by an author named Eric Bixa. The article was called Growing on the Grid and it was exactly on this subject. It talked about maximizing your growth potential by utilizing the horizontal space, not just the vertical space that our plants try to create. So one thing I should mention is that you will not be able to move these plants once you put the trellis net on. So you've got to do this in whatever room these plants will be flowering in. I started the example by using a 5x5 grow tent. So in most cases, we would veg in that 5x5, put up the scrog, and then flower it in that 5x5, not a big deal. If you are vegging and flowering in a different environment, you will have to veg them, drag them to the flowering room, try to put that trellis up on day one spread them out nice and wide. You're not going to be able to work them in too much, but you can kind of bend and manipulate the plants a little bit without causing any problems. Uh, Use the cracking technique I talked about earlier. Uh, Grab the branch, give it a little bit of a twist and bend it over just a little bit. You'll be able to create a little knuckle there. Also create a nice smooth bend. You can control the plant, aim it any direction you want, move it over to the section of the trellis you need it. Just be very gentle with them. Give them several days to recover before you go back in and crack them again. This is pretty much how we're forced to do it in a commercial environment because we don't veg and flower in the same room. We usually have one large veg area and multiple flowering rooms so that we can keep perpetual cycles going. In a commercial environment, one of my major goals is to harvest and refill a room in the same day. I know that doesn't sound like a big challenge, but imagine if you've got 300 plants in one room, you've got a bunch of trellis netting. It takes half of the day to get it cut down. Then you got to clean the room spotless then try to refill it. That's always fun. Then we throw the net on. Then we spend the rest of the day just spreading those plants out and adjusting that net to where those plants aren't too angry with us. So that is my long sidetrack rambly talk on sticks, cages, and trellis netting and canopy control. I've got a couple more quick things to cover on this list of ways to improve our productivity while in veg. The next thing on my list is integrated pest management and scouting. We should probably be applying a preventative pesticide regimen to our plants at this time. If you're going to use a spray application, now is the time to get started. If you're going to use predator bugs, now is the time to order them and get them prepared so that we have a nice colony before we go into flower. One thing a lot of growers overlook at this stage of the game is manually scouting for pests. One of your best tools in finding bugs in your grow is your own eyes. Spend a little time walking through the garden and just looking for pests or signs of pests. Nature really likes to give us hints that there are problems in our garden. Every pest that comes in gives us some kind of a warning. If you were on top of your game, you've got some yellow sticky traps hanging up and you are checking those on a daily basis. They will give you a fair warning that you've got bugs coming in. You know how they'll tell you? There will be bugs stuck to the yellow card. How much more obvious can it get? So check the yellow sticky traps. Then walk every row. Every few feet, 
reach into the canopy and grab a leaf, pull it right off, flip it upside down, look at it. Do you see any bugs on the underside of the leaf? Do you see any eggs on the underside of the leaf? Look at the top side of the leaf. Do you see any stippling? That is spider mite damage. Do you see any honeydew? That is thrip damage. Do you see anything that just doesn't look right? That could be a sign of overfeeding, underfeeding, or pH problems. Pay attention to the plants and they will tell you when something is starting to go wrong and you won't need to panic. So scout on a daily basis. Walk through the grow. Look at the plants. Look for mite damage. Look for thrip damage. Go smack the pots. Just give a couple pots a good smack. Does anything fly out? If so, you've got fungus gnats. Those are really easy to treat if you find them early. Scout for bugs. Teach all of your helpers to scout for bugs. Look for spider mite webbing. Also, look for powdery mildew. Look for anything that just doesn't look right. If you are a crew leader, teach people how to properly report the things that they see so they know when to come to you. Some people say, that ah, doesn't look like a big deal. Teach them what is a big deal and what is not a big deal. So always be on the lookout for bugs, always be scouting, and know what you're looking for. You're looking for mites and mite damage, which is webbing, stippling. Uh, you're looking for thrip shit. You're looking for thrip honeydew, that glazy stuff on the lower leaves, that's from your thrips. When you tap the pots, those little black things that fly up, those are fungus gnats. When you shake the leaves, those little white bugs that fly out, those are white flies. Be aware of what you're looking for and constantly be looking for them. Healthy plants will be much more vigorous and much more productive than plants that are fighting off insects. Also, scouting is free. It doesn't cost you anything to walk through your grow and look for bugs. You should enjoy it. Put on a podcast. Put on the Grow From Your Heart podcast. Throw on the Dude Grows. Put on some Joe Rogan and just stroll through the garden and go see what you can find today. Go find the problem. Chances are there's something wrong. You just need to go find it. All right, I'll quit ranting about IPM. Hopefully I've inspired you to go look for bugs in your garden. You know what else is free that will really improve the quality of your garden overall is note-taking. Write down everything you do. That way when something goes wrong, you know what to blame it on and you know what not to do next time. I've done an entire episode on journaling. I'm not going to rant too much on that right now. I've got one more thing to talk about, and then we're going to wrap up this podcast because my throat is starting to burn out. Another way we can increase productivity and vigor of our veg plants is to augment the CO2 levels in our grow room. The ambient CO2 level in your environment is probably hovering somewhere between 300 and 400 particles per million. That is just about the standard on earth. And my last research depends on where you are, your elevation, uh, what kind of city you're in but it's somewhere between 300 and 400 particles per million. Our plants would prefer somewhere around 1,000 particles per million. They can take up to 1,200, maybe 1,500. I've even seen people push them closer to 2,000 particles per million of CO2, and the plants just explode with vigorous growth. Now, there are several ways that you can increase the CO2 in your room. One thing I need to mention Once you start increasing the amount of CO2 in your grow room environment, it is very unhealthy for the plants to let the CO2 levels decline past what you have now increased it to. So if you start boosting it to 1,000, you either need to keep it at 1,000 or increase through flower. Your plant is expecting this CO2 as a new food source. It is now feeding itself like it's got another food source. You have now put your plant into another level of high performance It's expecting to get that high performance fuel. It's adjusted its diet accordingly. If you cut off that CO2, uh, that extra CO2, it will not be feeding itself properly. You will start seeing nutrient burn. So make sure you keep up on your CO2 habit if you start that habit. And also, if you run out and the plants start acting a little funny, that is probably what is causing it, is they're still craving that CO2. They're still trying to readjust their metabolism because they're still in that high performance mode and they're not sure what to do yet. So that was my last tip for increasing performance and productivity and vigor of our veg plants. I shared a lot of my dirty secrets, a lot of the things that I use in my personal grows, a lot of things that I use in the commercial grows. I hope you learned something from my talk today. I want to thank you guys again for listening. If you feel like this episode was educational, informative, or entertaining, and you would like to make a financial contribution to the show, I would appreciate your support. And you can do so by going to patreon.com slash growfromyourheart. All of the information you need to become a patron will be right there on the screen. And again, I do appreciate all of the Patreon support. I would also appreciate it if you follow me on social media. 
You can find me on Facebook. Simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. On Twitter, it's at GFYH podcast. If you'd like to follow my personal Twitter feed, it's at RastaJeff420. If you've got something to say and you're not into social media, you can reach me through email. My email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com, and I would love to hear from you. Don't forget that the podcast is available on YouTube. I will get the iTunes and Stitcher feed corrected very soon. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, the Hella Dank Seed Company at dankseed.store. I'll be back in just a few days with a fresh new episode. I want to thank you guys again for listening. I want to give a huge shout out to my buddy, Jesse James. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me.